You're listening to Luxury Insider, a podcast that highlights the hottest trends and innovations in the world of luxury, hosted by Invent Lux. Hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss an episode. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the Luxury Insider podcast. Uh, my name is Aidan, and I will be the host today. So today we're going to be looking at how AI can transform your core merchandising. And with me, I've got Elliot and James. So, welcome. Thank you. So, thanks for joining me today. Um, Would you like to start? Yeah, okay. I'm James James Mooney. Yeah. Um, I'm the business and strategy advisor for Nextel, um, who are an artificial intelligence um, business that provides tools for the um, fashion industry mainly. Um, I've been working in retail since a long time um, (laughs) and I've worked in uh, various businesses from Top shop to Primark to River Island. Uh, most recently, I've worked on the continent in France for Pimpkey. Okay. Um, two of those um, businesses um, have actually worked with Nextel, so I know Nextel quite well. Um, and I've moved to the more exciting tech side. Right. Um, and uh, as I say, on the new Elon Musk of, uh, <laughs> of uh, fashion um, tech. Um, so big so it is yeah, <laughs> a big big boost to fill. <laughs> um, so no, um, yeah, and I work with Elliot um, in next up. Very good. Yeah. And I'm uh, so I'm Elliot. Um, yeah, so I'm a business development manager here in the UK, uh, which basically means working from a commercial point of view with a number of different retailers, different brands in the fashion industry, uh, trying to kind of understand their issues and their challenges and then try and help them with technology to kind of overcome those challenges. And I think uh, I'm not as experienced as James, you know, not as, not as old and as wise, but, but my background is, uh, is also fashion and retail. Okay. I was working in Next uh, for about four or five years doing merchandising and then moved into the world of tech where I've been working with different retailers for about five years now okay. on, on various projects. So yeah, I think that, that helps us both to kind of, uh, one, of one of the things about our company is that when you come in, it helps if you understand kind of what the what the industry is going through first, okay. um, to be able to help them with the solutions yeah, that we yes. provide later on. Yeah, everybody in the UK team at least is um, <coughs> has a merchandising buying a merchandising background. So yeah. I ran merchandising teams at Topshop and, okay. and etc. And obviously, Elliot was in one of those teams in in Next. Um, yeah. And so yeah, we 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 all come from a from a position of understanding the pains of a yeah. fashion retailer, be it high street or be it um, kind of premium. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we're, uh, we're on that just kind of journey with those um, businesses to hopefully introduce a bit more artificial intelligence into their decision making. Interesting. So what are you seeing at the moment in terms of those, those pains? Um, it's pretty standard, if, if I'm honest, yeah. um, especially with the, um, uh, you know, dare I say a pandemic, um, because, you know, it's kind of threw everything up in the air again, um, yeah. after a little bit of stability before, where we had um, what we felt was a, was a change from um, stores to online, and yeah. everyone was getting used to this kind of move to away from the high street to online, and now um, with the um, advent of the of all, all of the new normal or new abnormal, if you want to call it, um, we, we've, we're seeing completely different um, models now. Yeah. Um, and and I think that history you can't rely on anymore, so you have to have um, new tools to be able to interact with, to get different scenarios, to talk, discuss scenarios, um, so, that, so that good people and um, intelligent people that come into the business can spend more time discussing decisions rather than getting to, to data and numbers, and, uh, which we both feel is um, our role is to get them to those scenarios quicker yeah. um, so that they can sit down with their you know, superiors, whatever, and say, look, we've gone through this three or four different ways. What do you think? You know, yeah. um, and we can help them on from kind of downstream um, uh, on planning all the way through to almost to marking down the product really. So it's kind of a source of truth. It is, yeah. It's a, it's a cold truth. Yeah. We we, we like to say. Um, so it's a it's a starting point, especially on your planning to say, um, to say you know if if you know if I asked you to do 
a planning document and Nadia and me we'd both we'd all come up <coughs> come up with three different yeah um, ideas which probably aren't wrong. I think I think just uh, we them. we come up with a with a, a view that is yeah. a cold view based on data. And I think that's kind of getting into kind of the detail. I think at high level when you look at the fashion industry, when you look at retail, um, they're probably dealing with kind of the, the same major problems that they're going through. So one is, you know, everybody's trying to make this move towards sustainability. Everybody wants to kind of get in there. Yeah. And and kind of one of the one of the recent kind of thought leaders in the in that space was saying the problem is both with overproduction and overconsumption. Mm -hmm. So it's like how do we help uh, businesses a uh, educate their consumers to consume the right amount of clothes in, yeah. on a daily basis, and how do we help retailers purchase the right amounts from the very beginning, so that they're not you know overproducing, polluting the environment, etc., and then marking things down and putting things into landfill at the end. Yeah. So sustainability is huge. I'd also say uh, omni-channel, which is what you yeah. touched on, you know, yeah. with the pandemic. You've got increasingly consumers are switching from one channel to the next. Okay. So you might buy something in the store and then go and return it somewhere else. You might buy it online and return it in the store. And customers want that fluidity. They want to be able to chop and change between kind of the retail environment. Yeah. And what you find is that kind of retailers that have old school systems, mm. They're not able to keep up with that demand. They're not able to do kind of click and collect, yeah. buy online, pick up in store, those type of models. Um, so that's that's another major challenge. And then the final challenge that we're seeing is supply chain disruption as well. So, you know, like everything from, you know, HDV drivers not being able to, you know, take stuff across the border, new stuff with Brexit, uh, paperwork, etc. Um, even retailers who own their own supply chains or who work really hard to own their own supply chains or control them, like Amazon, for instance, are reporting uh, you know, rises in stockouts. I think they reported a 14% rise in stockouts. Um, so there's all of those things going on to kind of create the perfect storm for retailers. Mm -hmm. And the kind of main message that, that they seem to be focusing on is trying to get the right, it's the old cliche, but trying to get the right product in the right place at the right time. Yeah. That has never been so important as it, as it is today, I think. Yeah. I, mean, I think there's a couple of other things as well. I think people are really important and, you know, people aren't, you know, who go to work now, they don't want to do some of the um, donkey work that, it's not that they don't want to, it's kind of a, uh, they don't need to. Yeah. So um, if you want to keep your best people, um, keep them fulfilled, inspired, stimulated, you have to have the right tools and you can't just go back to the beginning, the beginning every time you do planning. Definitely. Um, so for us, we, we believe that we can kind of um, inspire people by using these tools. Yeah, and level. And keep people. Level people up. I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, and that's, yeah. that's and, you know, it's never been so difficult to keep your your best people. Oh, yeah, and yeah. that's across everywhere. Yeah. 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 Re retention rates of staff is something that comes up a lot when we speak yeah. to kind of merchandising directors. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they see people coming out of university or wherever they're coming from and they're starting this job on their merchandising career. And then actually they just get so frustrated, you know, because the tools aren't in place. They end up okay. working ridiculous hours in retail, like anybody who works in retail will tell you. They work some serious hours, yeah. um, and they end up just losing their staff, and they yeah. all kind of go to different places and, okay. and try. And, but, but what we try and do is make their lives easier. Not only the people who are coming into the into the role, but also those from a senior position mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Try and give them the tools that they need to be able to be fulfilled, happy, leave the office at five. Dare I say, <laughs> you know, I mean that happens in retail. Yeah, but I think there's two other things as well. This um, this whole kind of. Um, second hand kind of yeah. um, revival obviously that was quite big um, years and years and years ago um, when things used to get um, passed down from you know older brother to younger yeah. brother etc it kind of that that kind of stopped yeah. and I think that whole vintage depop you know you know eBay as well you know yeah. they're all still massive in this this arena and any anyone who's in retail will tell you that they're trying to solve that problem as well mm, yeah. uh, they're kind of and then I guess there's kind of always going to be that um, need for um, fresh and new as well yeah um, but there's a lot of businesses out there and big um, investors who won't now invest in businesses that aren't sustainable yeah so 
you know, you're it's in this kind of, it's a core requirement. If I'm going to put money into this business, it's got to be sustainable. And I think, you know, that that is the big thing that's coming yeah. um, to us. Not not from a, oh, you know, that cotton's got to be sustainable, but, but the whole end-to-end -end process transparency, needs to be, yeah. needs to be yeah. Yeah, transparency, but also are we are overbuying? And yeah. I think that's yeah. the big deal. Yeah. And what, what are you seeing in regards to the renting market because I know my partner started she started renting a lot of dresses and it's it's yeah. quite an interesting concept. Um renting's an interesting one and I think also uh second hand as well yeah. is forecast to you know grow hugely as I think consumers begin to become more aware. I mean I think you introduced me to Vinted and now I don't have to say buy a little yeah. bit from there. Not, <laughs> yeah. no, not as much as you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, renting market meant to be meant to be growing yeah. as well. I think I think we're we're definitely seeing um, businesses dipping their toes into that yeah. uh, that market and um, some really uh, big players kind of saying that this could be something yeah. quite. I don't know if anyone's really nailed it yet. Yeah. Okay. As much as maybe some of the second hand want. Yeah. Um, I don't think we can all. Um, just off the top of our head, think of a, a, a you know a high you know high street, but you know yeah. a really really kind of um, memorable no. one. Um, there are there are big ones, but you know and I think that's still got to be. Um, I think there's still potential in that market. Yeah. I think we're, really where it's going is this kind of um, almost positive message about um, that you can um, reuse. Yeah, and I think that's the that for us is kind of a, an interesting opportunity to help those those markets as well as those uh, traditional markets that 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 buy new and sell new etc. So we yeah. want to be involved in all of those markets really. Totally. Yeah. So just talk me through the, the the process from start to finish in terms of what you're doing at Next Sale. So, so I think if we take like a, a level down from there, so they're kind of the major industry challenges that we yeah, see. So yeah. obviously the importance is on buying the right amount of stocks and putting the right amount of stocks in the stores or the different channels where you're going to register that demand. Basically, you know, you want to ensure that when you log in online or when you click online or when you go to the store, you have to have the right item there and the right size and the right color. Um, otherwise, you know, customers are fickle these days. They're just gonna they're gonna go straight online to your nearest competitor, and they're yeah. gonna buy the same product from them. Um, so that's kind of the the climate that we're dealing with. So that's kind of the the importance of putting the stock in the right place at the right time. And and when you look at kind of the retail industry, um, a lot of even mature retail players, you know, that have been around 10, 20, 30 years have kind of really, and you think they might be at the forefront of the industry, but actually they, they've built their kind of empire on, on old outdated systems. Okay. And at the bottom of that, it's, it's kind of, uh, a lot of a lot of people just churning out hours, like I said. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of think what we see is a, a bunch of old and fragmented systems uh, mm -hmm. built on top of with kind of Excels and various reporting tools that sit over the top to try and help them do what yeah. they need to. And I kind of think that we see a number of problems in that, in, in using that. Um, one is, of course, you know, we mentioned the hours, the, you know, the hours that people are working. The other is that there's so much human intuition involved. Mm. Say I buy you know, 5,000 pieces of this beautiful shirt, <laughs> um, and I want to allocate it to my store. So I want to decide how much needs to go into my stores and, in what, in, and what the demographic of each of those stores is. My stores in the south might be on a completely different season to the stores in the north. Yeah. They might have a completely different shopper going in there. There's a completely different size profile. They might not even like blue. Yeah. And so I need to kind of gather all of that information together in order to give me bottom-up kind of decision-making yeah. and data. Um, and right now we're seeing that retailers are kind of top-down. So okay. they're saying, okay, we bought 5,000. These are my stores, and we're send you know five hundred to each of them because these are my big flagship stores. Then I'm going to send two hundred to my smaller stores, yeah. and actually, you know, you're sending they're sending completely the wrong size mixes. Yeah. They're sending products that might not even sell in that store, mm -hmm. um, and they and they're sending things to the north that you know it might be in the it might be in the middle of their winter, and they're sending short sleeve shirts. Yeah. So it's kind of all about kind of developing that assortment and that mix to to meet the customer at the right time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, 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 you, what you find in retail is there's a lot of myths that are created over years of what sells where and you know that stores are 
good formal wear store and that stores are really good casual wear and this yeah. one only peaks at this time because of that and what what we've tried to do is is say well forget about all that and say um yeah let's let's plan as we plan and yeah. we've got um, some good tools to help planning um on the buy uh, but once we're sending the stock out let's look at what's happening right now um, and who's which stores doing um, doing well on each category yeah. and saying well what do they actually then require to keep their availability yeah. um, so it gives the it gives the retailers a chance to um, they bought this product gives them another chance to say well, what, how do I actually want to send this product out um, rather than the, the, maybe the way that I planned it six months ago when I was looking at um, buying this product and it's come in maybe three weeks late because it's been stuck on a boat, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think what we're trying to do is say, okay, take, take a step back and see what's actually happening out there. You know, if you've got two, 300 stores, even if you've got 30 stores, yeah. what, does, what do your stores actually require yeah. rather than um, yeah. what, you th what someone believed or, you know, your MD says, oh, you know, make sure it's in these stores or, you know, and I've, I've been there and it's, it's fine. You can override it if you want, but this, our, our tools give you the opportunity to say, no, this is where you should send it if you want yeah. to optimize it. Yeah. Only send this much out, then replenish this much based on those yeah. sales. And then maybe you might want to move some of that stock around towards the end of its life because um, you don't want to spend all, uh, a lot of markdown. So we help with that, that journey really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we touched on allocations to how much stock initially needs to go to the stores in order mm -hmm. to meet that initial kind of demand. But then, you know, that's only kind of the tip of the iceberg. So once the stock is in store selling, then you've got to have systems that, that actually uh, send the remainder of the units that are in the warehouse to the right stores or channels. You know, it might be your e-commerce, it might be your wholesale, it might be your other channels that are selling yeah. equally as well. Um, so you've got to have a tool that prioritizes where those remaining units should go. And it sounds kind of simple. Okay, let's, you know, in theory, put everything in, in competition with each other and you'd assume that, um, that, that retailers can do that. But actually today it's kind of, they're not able to do that. So if I sell, you know, if I sell a unit in Oxford Street, um, before you, before I sell a couple of units in a in a smaller store, does that mean Oxford Street should get should get the first unit, or does it mean, okay. and, and especially when we come to the scarcity of stock that exists in the warehouse, how should we begin to prioritise where those where those remaining units should go, and the, and the core concept behind kind of where we're going in next is we put everything in competition with each other, okay. um, so everything's always competing for where has the highest probability of demand. Um, which which is mm -hmm. you know really important. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just going to say really the retailers that we've um, worked with, kind of River Island, Pimkey, so that I've worked with. Um, what you find is that it doesn't send out as much stock as you think you need out in the store. So okay. um, so that's number one that that we've found, and um, and then the replenishment can then really find its way into those places that where the probability is going to be. And though you only need a really small difference to, to see some really big movement in yeah. terms of one, number one availability for the customer so yeah. they get what they need and what they want um, and number two for us um, creating sales routes which yeah. you know for, for the for the retail is like like kind of gold if you like. Yeah. So we've, we've done a lot of work in that arena so of course what's come back to us is well how, how can you help us um, buy the right quantity in the first place yeah. you know we were talking earlier about um, design etc yeah. you know designing beautiful products um, and you know loads of work and effort goes into the design and then you know loads of work and effort goes into the planning um, but essentially it's still a little bit of a um, educated guess based on um, lots of history lots of okay. uh, missed demand yeah what so a lot of feedback for, to us is well how can you get us to that point where you we buy we we have a better chance of buying the right quantity mm. so we've just launched a new um tool which called the buy okay we, we didn't really think much <laughs> <laughs> about that time. um <laughs> and uh, so it it basically will look at a navy jumper or a pair of um, white sneakers or whatever and, yeah. and look at historically um, what um, what is the optimal um, kind of uh, quantities that you require 
um, based on the, hi the history. Not, well, it's not really history, it's more a case of um, looking at all of the, um, the, the demands that you didn't, that you missed as well. Okay. So we've now created that tool so that um, but the buyers can again look at hard facts and say yeah. within seconds they can see what, how many Navy crew net jumpers we should have next season based yeah. on the last few seasons. And is that that's inward looking within your business as opposed to comparing it with other businesses that are selling white sneakers or correct, or correct. And that, that's an interesting point because that's and that's where we are today. So can kind of inward looking ingesting huge amounts of data that just people wouldn't even be able to analyze even if they're yeah. teams of hundreds. That's that's where we sit today. Um, where we're going in the future is 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 things like um, is things like looking outside the business. Okay. So, what are competitors releasing into the market? How's that going to affect what our sales? Yeah. What are weather patterns that are happening? You know, how how is that going to that kind of granular information? Yeah. If it's raining, how much you know how much footfall should I expect yeah. compared to on sunny days? So it's kind of the the external things now we're beginning to look at how we Absolutely. incorporate them into the system. And another thing that we're system. looking at as well is. Um, there's different tools that can scrape TikTok, it, you know, Instagram, etc., etc. And we we're we're looking at kind of coming up with a, a factor of saying, you know, trench coats versus this year versus last year. Is it being seen more yeah. on in various um, channels? So we can kind of give the the buyers and the product managers, the product developers, saying, you know, it should be bigger than last year because. We're seeing it more. Yeah. Um, so that that kind of thing is really exciting. And then finally, we're looking at um, kind of giving. Um, so when you're actually putting together your um, your range, um, so making recommendations on your assortment. So yeah. again, our customers are saying, "Can you help us with that?" Okay. Um, so we're putting together the range. What are what would you recommend? Um, we've got this buy. What would you recommend we buy um, before you even start your planning? Um, right. So it kind of populates your um, range plan, yeah. Um, so you don't have to again go back to doing some donkey work or whatever you want to call it. It's, so it's, think, yeah. It starts. It gives you a good start, and I think that's where we. And I think where where we sit where we sit today is as a as a business we've worked with or we're working with kind of some of the major names out there. Uh, you've got the likes of River Island in the UK, uh, from a UK perspective, River Island, White Stuff, uh, m Co, Mountain Warehouse, some of the retailers, but kind of more broadly, uh, working with brands like Versace, uh, just recently started working with Guess in the US. Nice. So there's, there's a whole kind of range, there's, yeah. I think there's about 60 plus brands on, on the, mm. within our group at the moment, yeah. um, and looking to kind of grow that aggressively. Um, but kind of where we have come from as a business is largely from the in-season management. So working with you know first allocations, replenishments, and transfers between stores, yeah. and that's and that's working great. And, and what we would always advocate to our customers is once you get that right, that's yeah. a solid foundation for then kind of moving upstream and moving into buying the right quantities, choosing the right items, reordering the right amounts, and that's kind of the the big plan for the solution. Start kind of. Uh, downstream and then move upstream as kind of you move further away from demand. One final thing that we did want to say <laughs> yeah, come on, is, let's go. is is we we do talk a lot, a lot about kind of we do talk a lot, <laughs> yeah. um, but we are um, we we want to be a pure play um, pure players tool as well. Um, yeah. There's a lot of pure players out there that have a multi warehouse multi dc yeah wherever wherever you have to optimize your stock whether be, be it um, in stores or be it in dcs we believe that we can help yeah um, there's lots of kind of especially with brexit and the new kind of tariff issues that are yeah. coming into the eu and going into you know we believe that we can help with that um, stock management um, so it's not just about kind of stores yeah. and channels and you know third parties we believe that we, we can work with pure players as well of course fundamentals are yeah the fundamentals are, yeah, are the yeah. same because you know you talk to the guys at asos you know you think oh it all just come yeah. kind of like comes out one little you, you put, know, you put, one, you put everything that the core the core kind of fundamental is even if you're an asos or, or an online player 
you typically, you've got your own website and you've got a number of different marketplaces that you're also using. So you need to be putting your stock in competition with each other for, yeah. for deciding where best to sell those particular units. And that's the core kind of philosophy around Nextel. And that's why it applies both to e-com, mm -hmm. pure play guys, mm -hmm. and also kind of mm -hmm. your traditional retail. And we can, well. we can also um, work with businesses to say, you know, the end of season stock, yeah. where, where should that go? Um, should it go to a charity? Should it go to a, um, a third party? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We, yeah. wherever there's stock movement, we believe that we can help optimise where that should be from a sustainable point of view, but yeah. also to you know, get your margins to the, to the maximum, because you know, yeah. that's what they're all there for at the end of the day. Um, so we try and keep that um, uh, message um, that it's not just around stores, channels, it's about stock movements and also giving the um, businesses a chance to have a cold look at how much to buy yeah. Um, yeah. in the first place. Yeah, look at the data. Trust look at the, the data. data. Look at the data <laughs> and, um, yeah, and try and take away some of that laborious stuff. Definitely. Well, look, I think that is a, uh, a great moment to, to take a pause. Thank, thank you so much for coming. No, thanks. It's been an absolute pleasure. pleasure. To have you on, and James. We can talk about it all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, thanks for listening. Um, if you enjoyed that, please hit subscribe on the bottom, and we'll be back next week with another podcast. All right, see you later. It's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you for watching Luxury Insider. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and give us a five star review. Like, comment, and share it with someone who'd find value in it too. Head on over to our website at www.inventlux.com to learn more and we'll see you on the next episode.